Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. Welcome back. If you're a regular listener, you know that we've been investigating conventional and unconventional relationships, and this episode was so relevant to the topic that I brought it back as a rerun. It presents some alternative types of marriage. Now, we haven't discussed it deeply on Solo, but I want to highlight some elements of marriage that may be relevant to our investigation. First, the marriage that you're familiar with, in which love is central and the happiness of the couple paramount, is a relatively new invention and not even the norm in every culture. We've discussed many of the reasons for the loosening of the reins of marriage, including the rise of birth control, women's equality and economic independence in particular, and of course the change in belief about sexual desire. The rise of the prominence of love in a marriage in many ways has been a positive development. However, it has also threatened the institution of marriage. After all, if there is no longer love, there is less reason to be married. Prior to all of this, marriage was designed to create alliances between families, and central to it, it was arranged as a partnership to secure land and other possessions, something that just didn't matter back in hunter-gatherer days. Of course, back then, you only owned what you could carry. I suggest reading a couple of excellent books if you want a deeper dive. One is Marriage, A History, How Love Conquered Marriage by Stephanie Kuntz. The other is The History of the Wife by Marilyn Yalom. I will put both of them in the exhibits of the blog post. In this episode, my guest Vicki Larson and I talk about her book that documents how people are adjusting marriage in less radical ways than some of the unconventional relationships that we've been exploring but nonetheless, adjusting marriage to make it work for them. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Let's get started. Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Vicki Larson. Vicki's an award-winning journalist, the lifestyle editor, columnist, and writer at the Marin Independent Journal. She's the co-author of The New I Do, Reshaping Marriage for Skeptics, Realists, and Rebels. Her writings can be found pretty much everywhere. The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Quartz, Huff Post, and Medium, to name a few. Welcome, Vicki. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. So, Vicki, how does one turn from being an award-winning journalist, lifestyle editor, columnist, and writer at the Marin Independent Journal and end up writing a book about reshaping marriage in a modern age? Well, you have to be divorced twice, probably. (laughs) (laughs) That really, really helped. (laughs) It's kind of like the guy who never married being the a host of Solo, The Single Person's Guide to a Remarkable right, Life. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's really an interesting story because I met Susan, my co-author, because she's a therapist mm-hmm. here in Marin, and um, for story, and I interviewed her, and then a few years later, Huffington Post started having a divorce uh, section, and yeah, oh, is that right? and so she was writing for it, and I was writing for it. So we said, hell, well, we should do something together, you know. Mm. And then after... This is after your second divorce? Yeah, I, I like I had to get married and have... I, I thank my former husband for, like, marrying me so I could divorce him, so I could write a book. <laughs> I never would have written a book about marriage if he hadn't married and divorced me. So it's really great. So, yeah, Susan told me that she'd been working on a book. And the thing, Susan started, kind of became known as a divorce coach because when she started, a lot of people uh, were coming to her. They were getting divorced and there weren't a lot of uh, support. There wasn't a lot of support for people. Mm, So she kind of 
that became her specialty. And the funny thing is, she wrote a book about divorce just as she was getting married for the first time at age 40. And, <laughs> and so she asked me to come on board. And, and we both came to it from really different angles. Susan not getting married until she was old. People were like, well, what's mm. wrong with you? I haven't been married and divorced twice. People would say, well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I have to say, I ha just had a conversation recently about this very mm -hmm. idea, you know, sort of being middle-aged and dating. And so there's, there's kind of, you know, sort of two places you can be in, and, and each of them has their, their cons, right? right? So the, fir the first one is, oh, he's never yeah. married. Not sure he can settle down. Is he ready to, quote, unquote, grow up? And then the other one is, well, he, yeah, he's been married, but he didn't do it very well. And so why, why should you expect that he's going <laughs> gonna to get it all worked out this second exactly. time? So well, speak. yeah, well, we were both experiencing the shame, which mm. tends to cloud the whole marriage versus single issue. Um, there's a lot of shaming because mm -hmm. if you're married and you don't make it until like someone has to die for you to have a successful marriage, right? Any other exit from marriage, you're doing it wrong. And then if you remain single, you're a suspect, you know, you're a spinster if you're a woman, um, if mm -hmm. you're a guy. A Peter Pan if you're totally. a guy. Yes. You know, and that's why mm -hmm. you see, you know, the, uh, the, the new magazines like George Clooney finally finally <laughs> getting <there. laughs> a little uh, yeah a little piece of me died when george clooney got well married. he actually had been married before people kind of forget about that he was not a lifelong bachelor yeah oh is that yeah, true i didn't know that marriage but um yeah i see his starter marriage his starter marriage say. yes i'm yes well that's a preview for yes. the listeners you'll see you'll see in a few moments here <laughs> So one thing that I think is very interesting, I did not know that HuffPost had a divorce column or section. Do they still or is it has it been um, shuttered? I think they still do. I mean, I yeah, they I was do. writing for HuffPost for quite a while in mostly in divorce. And then they changed their platform and not anyone could write for them. And so I, I kind of, you know, moved away and went to Medium, which sure. seems to be the new HuffPo. <laughs> it is yes. Medium is by. I actually purposely added that to the uh, to the list so you would be more mm -hmm. hip oh, yeah. because I'm, that's uh, so that's I'm the very, new hot hot location. I'm hot and it's hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting you that you bring that up because I came across. I was looking to pitch some solo focused articles. So take sort of take some of the podcast content that I have already, and then repurpose it for. Um, you know, a newspaper, magazine, op-ed, you know, just to, to do uh -huh. what you do, yeah. so to speak. Now, I, 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 was, I was unsuccessful, uh -huh. unfortunately, but, um, but what I did was I was sort of looking around for where might a good location be, right? You know, who's the right editor to target and so on. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, a professional journalist, so I don't have a, a light, I don't have a Rolodex right. of editors who, you know, in relationships and so on. So I'm, I'm, you know, looking at mastheads and cold emailing people and, and things like that. But I came across the Atlantic yeah. has a family Me section. Too. And I, I started fussing around with this. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I, I copied the announcement of the family uh -huh. section and I started rewriting it as if they were going to launch a single section oh, okay you know and i mean it's really fascinating like changing i wonder if i could find it as as we talk oh i do have it right here i'm gonna pull this up real quick just sure. as, if i can so this is this is me trying to to rewrite this right so it says so so the the title of it is family right. you know so i change it to single right. and it says introducing the atlantic's single section a new hub for the coverage of American life from the viewpoint of its most basic unit. When the Atlantic founders created this magazine 161 years ago, the single person was not top of mind. <laughs> <laughs> 
the Atlantic room would be de- devoted to art literature, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Is it? Soon enough, though, the editors came to understand that the well-being of a nation, its culture, and its economy was tied up with the health and vitality of its single people. And so the question single face, and I, I haven't put all those like questions well, I, in. I think that's I, awesome. You know, the Washington Post <laughs> had a single section. Lisa Bonos uh, ran Soloish. Yes, but that's, that's right. But it's now a relationship section see, or something. They're always now. trying to throw that that mm-hmm. narrative that um, yeah, <laughs> that narrative that everyone wants to be in a relationship and that is the normal thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let's um so you uh to step yes. back, you know, you 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 have some expertise from personal experience. You have some expertise from your writing. You have some ex- expertise from your yes. co-author, ob- obviously. But talk through a little bit more about the genesis of this book. This, you know, why do I have you on here? I want to talk yeah. about this book. I think it's a uh, fascinating thank concept. You. Well, we didn't go out to create new versions of marriage, but we noticed that they were already happening. And, you know, Mm. when people talk about marriage, they talk about traditional marriage as if there is one kind of marriage, but there isn't. Marriage has changed so much throughout history. Marriage looks different throughout the world. And Mm -hmm. so we really wanted to bust that stereotype. And also because the divorce rate is pretty high now. You know, the narrative is always that it's 50 percent. Well, it's not. It's more about 30 to 40 percent, depending on the age range. But for people my age, 50 and older, it is 50 percent. Yeah, that's right. You know, so um, I'm glad you brought that up because. I, I don't do um, series yet with uh-huh. solo, but sometimes I kind of hit on mm-hmm. a theme and it starts to, so early on I had like a little bit of a health and wellness, you know, you kind of line up a few people because I'm sort of thinking about right. that stuff. This will be in some, you know, within maybe four or five weeks, this will be a third kind of very relationship marriage okay. focused topic. And so one of them one of them is I have a conversation with Mary Dom where we talk about people who should not have married in history. <laughs> and, and so the way we think about it is if they were alive today, yeah. they probably wouldn't uh-huh. have married. Yeah. You know, like they didn't have a choice back then because you kind of had exactly. to. Exactly. I, I actually believe yes. my father, if he were a young man today, Uh, he would not have gotten married and and had children. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that he didn't love my mother or that he didn't love my sister and me. It's just that, you know, he went from being a dutiful son to being a dutiful husband to being Mm. a dutiful father. And it's not really like he probably would have loved to have been an airplane pilot or something. He would have, yeah, I mean, he was an engineer and he had a wonderful career. But I think, you know, when I try to get a sense of my dad, I don't think he would have married, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about this movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. It's a lovely film. I mean, you know, there's a lot to like about Jimmy Stewart. You know, he's kind of a, you know, you'd see how he would be hard to be a leading man today, but yet he pulled it off with with such grace. I would marry him. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, people forget people sort of ignore the beginning of that movie where he doesn't want to be married. He wants to go to South America. He wants to just take his piece of luggage and his map and see the world, you know? And because he was the dutiful son, Mm -hmm. he takes over the the building and loan, the Bailey building and loan. And then his, his brother goes off to war and has, you know, and then goes off to college and does all these kinds of things. And Bail and, and George Bailey becomes, you know, the loving husband, father, right. and so on. And so, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I, I had a striking conversation with my own dad um, when we were both adults. So uh, my parents divorced and I got kind of reunited with him in my, te- in my teens when I went off to college. And I remember sitting with him at a restaurant once and I just asked him, I was like, why did, like, why did you yeah. marry mom? 
You know, because it wasn't clear to me knowing both of them that a, they were a good pair, you know, like that it was like love at first sight or something like that kind of thing. And he, you know, it was, it was Vietnam. He was going off. He had been enlisted. He basically had, he has this fantastic story about being pulled in, pulled in front of a federal judge for uh, dodging wow. the draft. He, he wasn't dodging the draft, at least not. He, 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 was, he was just a screw up. Like, so he hadn't changed his address, basically. And they had sent his, uh, you know, his draft, whatever, notice to a previous uh, yeah. address and he didn't get it. And one day some, some MP, MPs show oh up my. at his door. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of thing. So, and I was like, so why did you do this? And, you know, he just said to me in, in this very matter of fact way, you know, this is the late 60s when this was all going on, he's like, that's what you do. That's just what you did. You know, it like, it was just that simple. Like there was no debating this and resisting this. Like you, it was just the next step in the process. And so your dad had that. It sounds like. Yeah. My dad, you know, they, they talk about women in those days and you know, the whole, uh, um, the feminine mystique was written about that. But, um, Barbara Ironrich, I think she wrote a book about the men. They were just as constrained as the women. Mm. I mean, <laughs> women had it a little harder. I mean, <laughs> oh, indeed. But yes. Um, yes, certain expectations. And so now. Look, if you wanted to have sex. Exactly. <laughs> Right? Yes. And, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, this very strong exactly. urge. Exactly. And especially if you're going off to war. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, well. Exactly. And so, you know, now here we are in, you know, 2020. You don't have to get married to have sex. You can have children without getting married. You, women are independently, uh, financially independent. You can live together. I mean, you can create whatever kind of life you want. And there still Mm -hmm. is this thing about marriage. Yes. And so I wanted to ask you about that. So before before I ask you about that, so the the other sort of theme is a uh, a podcast with Amy Garin. I, I don't know if you know um, Amy. She's a journalist, and she so she wrote a book called "Stepping Off the Relationship Escalator," mm-hmm. and it's a really fascinating book. And in it, she puts forth these sort of criteria for what she describes as this relationship escalator. And and you you re- you referred to one of them, which is this idea of um, a successful relationship ends with someone dying. Yes. Yes. You know, and so, um, so her, her, the criteria she puts forth is, you know, sexual romantic exclusivity. So Mm -hmm. monogamy, um, merging. So merging your, um, identity or your infrastructure, you know, your bank accounts, your living arrangements, hierarchy. That is that this relationship has some special status, Right. right? So you can do things with this relationship that you couldn't with other relationships, you know? So, so the example she uses is suppose you invited your best friend to go to join you at someone's wedding rather than your spouse, right? You know, people are like, well, of course you should bring your spouse, but why are you bringing your friend? That's weird. Um, so, so things, and then, um, uh, this idea of of sexual connection that we were talking about, that there's some sexual Mm -hmm. intimacy there. And then the last one, which you've alluded to, is continuity and consistency. So, it right, it it, re- it remain it starts at some point and it remains until some end and point. The ideal end is death. <laughs> is death? That's right. So, I bring this up because um, in your book you spend most of the book you, you dedicate a chapter one chapter to each of several different. Um, types right. of marriage, like altered, revised, well, renewed, well, improved versions, so well, to speak. So, yeah. These are my words. So, if, okay, so right now, as we talked about, the only way to decide that a marriage is successful is if it lasts mm-hmm. until death. But, yeah, that's a poor, well, poor indicator. Because you can have a loveless, full of contempt 
angry, abusive, horrific marriage, and a lot of them are like that, um, and people will say that's a success. So, you know, we were yes. like, no, that's, that's not a success. So we said, what if people just married according to their values and goals? Like, what do I want from this okay. marriage? What am I looking for? And so, okay. and then you actually can decide whether it's going to be a successful marriage or not, because you're saying, mm. this is what we w- I want this, you want that too. Okay, so this is going to make our marriage successful. So let's say you just want to have children. So now do you have to marry the love of your life um, as someone who's a great uh, uh, sexual partner? Or do you want to marry someone who's going to be a really good dad or a really good mom? Mm-hmm. That should be really your yeah. priority. And then if you raise the kids to whatever age you decide is the age that Good, good enough, enough. <laughs> usually 18 when they're <laughs> off to college, then you can say, do we want to stay together? And if we do, do uh-huh. we want to switch it up? Maybe we want to uh, have an open marriage at this point. So, yeah. So what we want to do is to help people individualize their marriage based on their values okay. and goals and needs. Okay, so we're going to okay. go through each of those. So the one you just described is a parenting yes. marriage, as I think <laughs> that's right. So so they have terms for them. So I'm gonna I, I, yes. I hope to get them right. But the uh, so we'll, we'll revisit that okay. one briefly. But I want to ask you why. So I, first of all, I commend the two of you for doing this. I think it's actually a, a very useful conversation in terms of just trying to get people to shift away from the one standard that this is what marriage should right. look like. And, and as we know, as you were saying, the, the, mar- you know, the divorce rates are high enough that, to put that, that standard into yeah. question. Um, I, my analysis, I was glad to hear what your analysis was. My analysis was like, it's like 35%. Like, what is the probability that you will get divorced? And that, but that number goes up or down depending on a right. lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, the people who, right. So, like, for example, um, low income mm-hmm. people have a much higher probability, for example. Like, so, so one of the sad things about marriage is it's actually stacked against the people who could probably, in, in many ways, need Maybe, it the most. You know, in terms of like resources and, yeah, and well, so you on. Know, yeah. But you could have a roommate too. <laughs> I, I do remind I, people actually, that yeah. if, cause if you're just getting married for the financial thing and believe me, marriage is a financial arrangement. As you know, it is the number one financial arrangement. Uh, if that is why you're getting married, get creative and think of something, get a roommate. Air- yeah, I think you should exhaust more yes. options before <laughs> you. You should take some online courses and try to improve your career. So, so I want to, but I want to press you sure. on one on one thing. I promise this is the this is the most mean I'm okay. going to be, which is why even stick with marriage, right? So why even continue to use that yeah. standard? Like, so I feel like you have deviated, but you know you kind of. Done a, a it's little a, turn it's a there. very valuable question, and I'm going okay. to answer it. Because okay. <laughs> when you wed, in the United States anyway, you are privy to more than 1,100 federal perks and protections, and then there's some on the state level. So what we have okay. done is we say, oh, you two are making this commitment here, you can, you, here's, here's the all these goodies. And, and then it even, and it, it, yes. And, and then when social security was changed, oh, in the fifties, I think post-war, then it really kind of encouraged the breadwinner, um, uh, homemaker model. So it, I see. Yes. And so, yeah. So privileges. Now, in other parts of the world, you don't have to get married to get privileges. And I think it is ridiculous to privilege people based on their romantic and sexual life. 
It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. that's what we got. And if that's what we got, then people should consider that. Now, you know, I know a number of people who are longtime uh, cohabiting couples. They've never gotten married. And they are in sometimes in some ways they might be losing out on things, but that's a choice they made. And actually, two economists, um, one was in the Obama administration, Betsy Stevenson and her partner, uh, Justin Wolfers, they have children together, at least, or maybe one child. And they don't live together because uh, they don't, I'm sorry, they're not married, they live together, because they did the economics on it. And they decided that it's better if we don't wed. So people don't, people should really think about that if they do want to get married and see, is marriage going to really help us? Or is marriage going to hurt us? But it, it tends to, mm -hmm. to help a bunch of people because of those perks and privileges. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I know um, uh, a previous guest, she, she comes up all the time, but yeah, Bella I know DePaulo, Bella, yeah. Um, you, yeah, so <laughs> everybody knows Bella, Bella who, who's in playing <laughs> yeah. in this space. Um, she, she's done, I think, some very good work on not only like where are, where are the, the benefits, where are the perceived yes. benefits, and then obviously also there are also are where are right. the costs, right? So when you, as we were talking about earlier, when you don't do right. this thing, yes, um, you you know people and it's, and I th and obviously, um, again I think it's it's harder society is harder on women who don't do it than than men. There's a double society is hard on women in a there. lot of ways, but that is a different conversation. Indeed. For another day. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I mean, of course, you know, as a man, I also will say it's society is hard on men and women, yes. but in different yes. and, ways. And I am the mother of two right. young men. And yes, and I, right. I, I, so. I know the messages they get too. Yes, I'm aware. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's, it, it, I, it's a gentle reminder that I say, like, you know, as we're taping this during, you know, the Black Lives right. Matters. Um, time and you know one thing that is absent from this conversation is who who gets killed by police is it's almost exclusively yes. men you know the, that and is so, true. Um, but but when it comes to relational elements and caregiving and um, challenges in terms of balancing career and parenting and I mean I'm one of the things that like you know one of the great funny sad statistics is you know, the second yes. shift has gotten worse during the pandemic in some yes. in some ways. Yeah, it, it, yes, know, it has. I've um, been reading a lot of um, articles about that. And and then there's been a lot of books about, you know, men, getting men to do their share and this and that. And I just want to scream because, you know, one of the things in our book and something that I'm a big believer in is relationship or marital contracts in which you – come to agree, you have some hard discussions about things, you come mm -hmm. to agreements, you hold each other accountable, and you talk it through, maybe yearly and go, how's it working? It's not working. Yes. Rather than what most people do is build up the resentments and the this and the that. And, you know, this is what breaks up a lot of marriages. I hate to say it, there's so much resentment. I remember a few years ago, um, there was an article in, uh, I think it was parents magazine and the headline was mad at dad and they like more than a thousand women wrote in and like 75 percent of them like some huge amount were just pissed off at their husbands all the time ah, I see. because of all of the stuff that they were doing um and that the guys mm -hmm. weren't doing or weren't doing enough of or whatever so it that's a problem that is indeed. That's a real. That's a real problem because those are also those things are fixable. Totally. Right. These are not. It's not like these are major no. differences of opinion and lifestyle. It's this totally is fixed. about cooking meals and cleaning <laughs> dishes and vacuuming and yes, running errands, and buying like, the birthday gifts and making the calls yes. to the parents. I mean, it, it is totally fixable. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, this reminds me of a story of um, a colleague that um, had been married. Not, this is not a close colleague. This is someone in, in my career world. 
had been married, had kids, was divorced, and then met um, met a, met a woman who, and they you know they started dating, had a good relationship. She said, "I want to have children. I want to I want to get married and have children." And he's like, "I've I've had children. I'm not really that excited to do this, but I will marry you." And I will impregnate you. I mean, he, he didn't say it. And the, these are my words, not his. Um, I will contribute financially, but I'm not, I'm not going to change diapers. I'm not going to, you know, and like, like Trump. <laughs> these, these are the things that I will right. not do. Right. I've done it. I don't want to do it again. I understand why you want to have kids. I, you know, and she said yes to that. You know, she was like, okay. That's that's our agreement. That's yeah. our arrangement. Is it working kind of out? Thing. Well, you know, as far as yeah. I know, but, um, you know, it... it uh, but in a way, I can see that um, it would work because it, it gives one person total control. Because if one person mm. wants to raise the child a certain way and wants to, you know, do this kind of education and this kind of religious training and this kind of disciplining... You don't have to argue mm. with someone. And actually, a lot of single moms say it's so much easier in that respect. It's their see. Yes. control. They can do whatever they want. Yes. And they don't have to negotiate with someone. Yes. And especially um, especially when it's when there's no tiebreaker, right. <laughs> you know. And so, like, you know, when you, when you have three people, you've got a tiebreaker. <laughs> But when it's two, right, you've got at some point, and, and some of these things, there's yes. no middle ground, right? You know what I mean? Like you have to choose one right, path or exactly. another. <laughs> um, that's a very good point. But, but I think what, what that story, that, that story is a nice segue into these different types of marriage that you, that you and Susan um, put forth in The New I Do. So let's start with the okay. start of marriage. Well, I had one of those. I mean, really, but not okay. intentionally. You know, I mean, I just... You didn't set out for no, it to be your starter. No, marriage. we were just poorly okay. matched. And I was, it was a few months before my 21st birthday. And he asked me, and we never discussed anything. And I said, okay. And then realized, <laughs> this is not working. So a start... How long did it take before you realized a it wasn't working? A few years. You know, we were married maybe okay. for about four years, but we had we, we didn't divorce for a while. So we were probably together for about three and a half years. So, um, so a starter marriage is a marriage okay. of under five years. There should be really no children okay. involved. And... Is it with younger, generally younger folks generally yes yeah okay. it doesn't have to be but generally and it's kind mm -hmm. of like trying marriage on for size um and then people push back and like we'll just live together that's marriage light but it's not because everyone understands husband wife people don't understand always living together are you living together mm -hmm. just because you're saving money or do you are you in love with each other what you love with each other um is who does what um you know and it doesn't have the cachet i suppose of uh, yeah, yeah the, the hierarchy, hierarchy. Yeah. that's the that, so yes yeah so but our idea of a starter marriage actually is not new throughout history there have been starter marriages um it's uh so we, th it's part of what we think marriage should be, which is should be a term limited, renewable marriage, <laughs> which again isn't even really new. I mean, Margaret Mead said, you know, she was speaking for women. She and this is back in the day. She said, you know, women should have three husbands: one for youthful sex, back in the day when you couldn't have sex; yes. one to raise children with. And one in old age to be your companion. Ah. And I'm like, yeah, Margaret, go. That's exactly what we need. <laughs> That's outstanding. I had not heard yes. that story. Um, and so, so the way we present a starter marriage is that you do come up with this relationship contract of why are we doing this? And it's not that you 
or doing it because you think you're going to split. You're doing it because, well, we do care about each other and we do want to be together. And let's see if, you know, we're on the same page about things. And so we have like a sample marital contract for a starter marriage, you know, of like, what are our goals? What do we want to do? How are we going to handle things like in-laws and pets and friends visiting and who moves for whom's job, you know? Mm -hmm. In other words, we really want people to have a lot of conversations before they go into a marriage. People spend so much time planning a wedding and they forget yes. to plan a marriage. I think it's striking the amount of time and resources that go into planning a six-hour event. I, it never used to be like that. You know, I, I, well, I, maybe, it, I don't know. I got married, you know, on a mountaintop in Colorado and then under a tree in Balboa Park. So <laughs> um, I, I'm not that kind of wedding person. But... Um, what you know everyone made fun of Gwyneth Paltrow when she, you know she consciously uncoupled but yes. we want people to consciously couple so really yes. think about this thing that you're doing have conversations uh and then and then i mean ideally at the end of the period that you decide then you say okay that was great or that wasn't so great and if we did have temporary time limited marriage licenses then you would be able to split without all of the drama of of a divorce and the expense of a divorce you know mm -hmm. uh, and there as i say there have been in history certain things like that very similar to that and i think it's we're ready for that again we're really ready for um temporary marriages and starter marriages where you just see if you're a good fit see if your goals are aligned and then yeah and then if it if it doesn't work then you can split and if it does work then you can decide well where are we going now do we want to have children mm -hmm. you know and then you will transform your marriage into whatever you want it to be in the next phase because you know you, you there are phases I, to a marriage right well as margaret mead exactly points out. and also if you look at some of the div the timings of divorces the, you know, the joke is a seven-year itch, but it is kind of seven, fourteen, twenty-one. Uh -huh. There is a little bit of a rhythm to when there is some divorce happening. Yeah, I see. I had a divorce mediator on, and one of the things that she pointed out that I thought was very interesting was, um, you know, there's all this resistance to people having yeah. a prenup, and so. You know, in some ways, what you're describing is a little bit of some of the kinds of conversations that you have with a prenup, which is, should we split? This is how this is how it will, right. will go down. Yeah, that's fine. Prenups generally are strictly financial stuff, but that's yes. kind of changing. So, yes, this is, and a prenup scares people. It sounds so negative, like you're planning your divorce, yes. but actually, it's yes. smart because the state has it. The state has a plan for you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's what she said. Yeah. She said, look, you may resist a prenup, but just know oh, yeah. you have a prenup. It's just right. not called that. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I thought that was a really insightful thing. I think it's actually a strong way yes. to argue for a prenup, which is, would you be comfortable with exactly. this outcome? And if you're not comfortable with this outcome, then you should right. have a prenup. Yes. And, and, and yes. so in calling it a marital plan, although in the book we do call it a prenup, I, I just forget what we called it in the book. <laughs> I see. It's a plan. Um, what you are doing, it, it's, it's much more, it sounds better. You're planning. You're planning something. Mm -hmm. You're agreeing to things. And uh, that sounds so much more positive, really even though it basically yeah. is the same thing. Yeah, I get it. Um, I can see how it would be quite threatening for people to, to do that. But I also sense that if you're, if you and your partner want to do this, it's already a good yes. sign that you will have some compatibility. Yes. And you, 
I think I can imagine the challenge is one person wants to do it. One person is very uh-huh. pragmatic and the other one uh, may subscribe to sort of a more kind of, you know, traditional or at least um, contemporary yeah. view well, of love well, and marriage. If that's and happening, so that would be like, let's not rush into marriage. <laughs> let's talk yes. some more. <laughs> so, so you've already mentioned uh, one of the other ones, which is yeah. this parenting marriage, the idea. And I, I think that that's a very, you know, um, again, talking about dating, I, I noticed this with women in their sort of mid to late 30s, you know, um, where there is uh, some urgency sure. to figure this all out because, um, because they want to have yeah. children. And, and the challenge of finding a partner who provides everything in that very short period of time, uh, I think, is a very yeah, real challenge. Yeah, and so you're seeing, you know, more women who are freezing their eggs or whatever. Um, but and, – and you're also seeing the rise of these websites like Family by Design and Co-Parenting and oh. Ma- Madamily, which is how – um, what, what are the, I've not come across, obviously I'm not, not the, the target, target market for these things. So, <laughs> so what, um, what, what so, is family by design so and all these about? Let's say you're, you're a guy and you want to have a kid and I'm a woman and I want to have a baby, but I don't want to be a single okay. mom and you don't want to be a single dad. Um, sure. That's hard. That can be by very the way. hard. That can be so very difficult. It's like a yes. dating site in that you kind of find someone to have a baby with and it can be that you know you live close to each other or you live together or you don't Uh, you can arrange it however you want but there it's like you fill out forms and there's background checks and there's this and that and you have discussions about money and how is this happening and who's changing the diapers and everything you're like really planning Mm. your parenthood and that's what most people don't do and you know, originally, this was a way for, you know, uh, LGBT people to um, mm. find a way to, to have children, because if you're two guys, it's that's hard or two women. But, um, but now more heterosexual people are looking into that. And so our parenting marriage is not quite like that, although it could be, you could just get together with someone to just have children mm-hmm. with and then, you know, after age 18 or 20, whatever, say, okay, we did our job. Um, or it can be also that um, you have a contract of that t- time length and then after that you decide what you're going to do. And I actually met someone on an airplane once and uh, he ha- had lived with his partner for seven years and he said they were getting married and I said oh how well why why after seven years and he said exactly that we want to have children we're agreeing to 18 years Mm -hmm. together and after that we'll see and um, I thought okay so and also in choosing a parenting marriage maybe your focus is like we talked about before not like the guy who's going to give you great sex but the person who's going to be an amazing dad you want you're looking for Mm -hmm. these attributes this kind of personality and so the focus is more on children and a lot of marriages now what they call high investment marriages are are really focused around the children so a parenting marriage makes sense i see okay now the flip side of that is a companion yeah. marriage. <laughs> so I struggled a little bit with a companionship marriage because I really couldn't quite put, it, it's kind of like a spillover to me in that it could be a lot of things. So, you know, my co-writer and her husband, they married older. They're not having children. So in a way they have a companionship marriage. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that it's only for people who don't have children because you can, but it tends to be the kind of marriage that child-free uh, uh, people have. Mm-hmm. Um, like they're like, this is so good. <laughs> yeah, Let's not screw it up exactly. with a couple kids. <laughs> exactly. Oh. And it also could be, 
I have I have I have friends. I have friends. They will not be named, but they are a kind of they have great kids, but they're like I cannot wait for these kids yeah. to go to college so I can start spending more time yeah. with my wife. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that that I mean that's really it's really wonderful and refreshing yes. to hear like you know you've and cuz they've done a fantastic job being parents. Like the kids are amazing, but they they have this connection, yeah. you know, that really seems to be this way. Like, they're sort of like, all right, kids, you know what I mean? No gap fear for you. Yeah. You're going I mean, to college. It's so funny because, <laughs> I mean, I grew up where I was talking about this with friends the other day. I mean, our mothers didn't even know where we were. Like, bye, mom. Okay, mm. be home for dinner. It, it was back. It was easier but back they then. Just, my mom went about her life. You know, she was in her sewing yes. room doing her thing, and then she was making dinner. She didn't check on me. Where are you? She didn't fawn all over me. And I actually, I, because I'm kind of one of these strange people who doesn't really watch TV. I was watching Mad Men um, before it went away on Netflix, and I was just looking at them. You know, they didn't fawn over their children. As a matter of fact, they didn't really even pay attention to them. I don't even think they were very nice to them. <laughs> and I mean, now parents are just. So intense. It's a heavy oh. lift. It's but very done difficult it to themselves. I think because they're just so afraid that if they don't do all of this stuff, their kids will fail in in the world. And I'm wondering if what we're going through now with the pandemic is a total reset for people. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I think like I think it's a t- I, I think it's tough. I have um, I have sympathy. Oh, yeah you know, for these sort of modern day parents, because it, it comes from a place of love and it comes from a place of wanting to see their kids to be successful and yes. healthy and happy and, and so on. The tough thing is it's very, di- first of all, 40 to 50% of mm-hmm. it is genetics. Right. So, you know what I mean? Let's say 40% of it's genetics, right? So, all right, well that, those dice Absolutely. have been rolled already. So there's no unrolling them. And then, you know, there's another 40%, which is like the stuff that you, you know, give them access to, you know, give, you know, get, send them to the sure. right schools and nutrition and all this stuff. And then there's like 20% of just randomness in the world, you know, that you have very that little is true, control but parents over. parents can really mess up kids. Although I feel as a mother myself that I am responsible for keeping the next generation of shrinks in business. I have done, I've done my part. <laughs> Well, I think I think it's fair, right? Because what I, you know, as a college professor, you know, I see, I teach the kids who yeah. had everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when, like, you know, not, I mean, not all of my students, but many of my students come from very privileged backgrounds, both parents, not divorced, you know, uh, middle, upper middle class and beyond incomes, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the things that are necessary to get you into a, right. into a top school. And yet they struggle, you know what I mean? And so the idea is, of course, you give them everything that you can because you don't know what matters right. and what doesn't matter. And, and even despite doing that, they all can't, it's not Lake Wobegon, right? Like they're not all going to be, you know, super successful, super tall, super happy, super beautiful, no, super healthy, life is super, a all those things. <laughs> yes. And then... And then, of course, as as you know, adversity is, is good. Yeah. Right. That's you know that's how you build strong bones and you strong and you build muscle is because yeah. you tax T- totally. the body. Yeah. Failure is really important. People are afraid to let their kids fail, um, and that is a really good thing for them to do. I mean, not in the way that they're going to you know end up in jail or something. No, but, no, no. They're yeah, small. These are these are these are small, small failures, failures yeah. not. And not, also, yeah, to, that you can reinvent yourself if you make a mistake. I mean, I, you know, I, I, it took me four schools in ten years to graduate college because I did a lot of stupid things like get married at age twenty. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, then you can find your way. And I think kids yes. now are, are afraid to do that. People are afraid to let them do that. Yeah. But we digress. <laughs> we di- We did digress. So, so the companion marriage folks don't have to worry no. about this. No, and, and, and that's a little marriage also I, for, you know, I would say like people who are asexual, you know, who are really not interested in mm-hmm. that kind of romantic 
sexual thing. And I actually see it could be a marriage of between friends who really just, you know, so yeah. yes, it's a spillover kind of marital model. Got it. <laughs> no, no, but again, you know, so that's one. Um, yeah, I, I completely understand. So that's one, for example, that in terms of Amy Guerin's uh, relationship escalator may not have a sexual right. connection per se, you doesn't know what I mean? Or something to. like that. Yeah. It doesn't have to. And you know, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate when you think about it, right? So imagine, you know, imagine you're married, you have kids, you, you are really quite fond of, you have affection for uh -huh. your partner, but the person doesn't turn you on. You don't like having yeah. sex with him or her. By today's yeah. standards, you either have to forego a healthy yeah. sex life or cheat or right. get divorced or Thank open you, your Bill. marriage up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the sad thing is, if you, if you said to the world, which of those is the best mm -hmm. option, much of the world will say, well, you got to go yeah. out without the that, sex. Yes. You know what I mean? And, and so that's a, you know, and so because if you get divorced, now you're being selfish and what are you doing to the kids and all this stuff? If you're cheating, obviously, we know the problems right. um, with that. And then enough people find having an open marriage mm -hmm. distasteful. Yeah. You know, and yet you present. Open marriage. Yeah. One of your, one of your, your marriages in, in the book right. is the well, open marriage. You know, look, a lot of people don't really have honest discussions about monogamy. They don't really discuss mm -hmm. if they're good at it. Are they choosing it? Do they like it? Have they ever not liked it? Have they ever not done it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and whenever we talk about monogamy, it's always like um, non-monogamy. It's always like, well, it's cheating or, you know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. there's something wrong with it. Uh, instead of yes. realizing that, why is monogamy the norm? You know, why, mm -hmm. why do we choose that? And then, you know, people will say, well, it's so that, you know, it's evolutionary because women want to raise their children. And like, yeah, you know, most of the evolutionary biologists are men. They're saying that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Wednesday Morton's book, Untrue. Uh, yeah, I yes. mean, monogamy She's going to be oh, a guest at some her. point. You'll have fun with her. Um, <laughs> yeah. She, you know, monogamy does not necessarily suit women any better than it does men. About two years is about when it starts to all. But also mm. people don't talk about it and they don't talk about it even if like, what if one of us becomes disabled or has an illness or mm -hmm. whatever. One of the women we interviewed in our book I think she was from Australia. Her husband, whom she loves, uh, became unable to have sex of any type. And he encouraged her to find someone for sex. And when she would be out with that person, you know, it was so much um, shame and judgment. But they didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't really have very many healthy models of consensual non-monogamy and you know generally people talk about jada pinkin smith and will smith and like oh do they have an open marriage whatever and you know and they're always like denying 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 <laughs> and i'm like what if they did so what yes it would be useful it would be if great they if they did it would be good for the it would be good for the world to yes. have successful couples. i think so and it's you I know agree with that at least to ex think about the choices that you're making. And maybe you decide that, you know, I really like monogamy, but at least you're making that decision. You're not just doing it blindly because you think that's the only way to be. And, you know. I think it's tough. Yeah, this is tough, right? Because so much of the undercurrent of the conversation that we're having is the tension between what these two right. people want and mm -hmm. what's best for them. And then what does Aunt Sarah think <laughs> about this? You know what I mean? And like, what will, 
right? What is the, you know, what, what's the, you know, our kid's coach going to think about like the community, yeah. the, the family, the, you know, there's a lot of um, social is. pressure. Totally. And, and then also, as you were saying, not only is like the benefits from, mm -hmm. from the government, but the, but there are sort of societal right. benefits, you know? So for example, in, in the case of your friend, so she has a husband and then she has a lover. And so, well, what if the lover, you know, is a foodie and she loves, you know what I mean? And, and he, he, he's like a uh -huh. great dinner companion. Yeah. And then she gets invited to, you know, uh -huh. a couple's dinner, right? Like, well, she's got this one man yeah. that she could bring who he might do it because, you know, he's obligated to do it. And then she has this other man that she could bring who would be appreciative. She would yeah, have a better yeah. time. The guests would have a better time because he would bring more yeah. to the dinner table, right. so, to <laughs> so to speak. And <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> and, and then, but if, if, you know, she might get uninvited to future things because she brings her lover and how awkward yeah. that is and so on. Yeah, it's a tough, you know, it yeah, can be a tough and also, world, I think. You know, among um, people in polyamorous um, communities, they don't often talk about it because in, if, if someone is divorced, I mean, children can be taken away. You know, so in those situations, mm. I understand why you might want to keep things quiet. Um, because there are real life consequences of that, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it it isn't an option that a lot of people think of. And if you're in a quote unquote sexless marriage, it, you're not really going to find a, a counselor who's going to suggest it. You know, they'll like mm -hmm. talk about you know amp it up and date night. They'll try to solve the yes. sex problem. And so there yes, are a right. lot of people who are mismatched sexually with partners and um and they're unhappy and it makes them feel bad and um mm -hmm. yeah so we we offer that as yeah. an option <laughs> okay super so uh let's we we've alluded to one before that you, at least i think so that you yeah. call a safety marriage so you know some people would call that like a gold digger marriage or something you know, they go look at Crystal Harris when she was married to um, Hugh Hefner and say, well, she's a, go hey, uh -huh. you know, 60 year difference. I mean, she can't possibly be loved. But honestly, if you are marrying for money or safety, however you want to call it. Okay. Um, and you are upfront about that, that is an arrangement. And it is probably much more transparent than someone who doesn't share that as soon as we get married, yes. I'm going to quit my job and I just want to be full time, right. whatever. Um, and, you know, and still have a housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah. happen. <laughs> I'm like, uh, why does this homemaker have a housekeeper? It's a, it's a big house. It's a big, big house. But um, so that might not be for everybody. However, yes. because as we were saying, marriage is a financial arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be transparent about it. And, you know, some of the people we interviewed in the book um, after the recession were looking for someone who had health insurance. And mm -hmm. I can see people needing that right now because the way that we get health mm -hmm. insurance is through employment. So, uh, or through marriage. Or through marriage. Right? And uh, I, that's mm -hmm. wrong. Um, everyone should be entitled to that. But so marriage is a financial arrangement. Maybe you want to have that kind of a marriage. And I, there's no judgment for me on that as long as everyone's being transparent about it. Yeah, that's right. There's consent. consent. I, I think it's fascinating. I mean, certainly with the rise of, um, of dating apps mm -hmm. and the internet, you've seen more transparency. I mean, um, this is always like some exchange. It is always an exchange. <laughs> uh, so, so my, 
Yeah, so my friend Kathleen Voss and her, her co-author, um, Roy Baumeister, have written about what they call mm-hmm. sexual economics. And it's funny because they, you know, they try to publish these papers in these um, peer-reviewed journals that are you know, edited and reviewed by fairly liberal people, pr- very progressive people, and, um, and folks who, who rightfully are um, champions of equality and egalitarianism and so on. And they get a lot, a lot of pushback yeah. from, from this. And they're always surprised because there's so much evidence for yes. sexual economics, for an exchange, um, you know, obvi- the prostitution being the most, you know, common and arguably, you know, they always right. say the oldest profession, so to speak. But, um, you know, these arrangements, there's a, there's a website, um, I think it's called oh, Seeking Sugar Arrangements Daddy. or something com? like that. There's one. Oh, is that? Well, it's even more so. Okay. Right. You know, I mean, as well as like on the apps, you know, where people are sort of very, either very blatant or very coded in their language um, around, around this topic, which, you know, about lifestyle and generosity and, you know, and so on. And I I share the same belief that you do, which is as long as there's consent, Mm -hmm. as long as these are adults and there's consent, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that. There's, there's much to art. I mean, you may find people may find it distasteful, but you just say it's not, it's not right for you, but it seems to be working for, for before Hef, he, you know, before he died. So successful marriage before he passed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Touche. So, um, I think your, I think your book, I, I wrote this down and actually I went down the rabbit hole and looked at this. I think your book brought this to, to, I didn't know this, but if you're in the U S mm-hmm. military, and you get married, you yes, get a you pay do. increase. And as a result of that, some military personnel seek yeah. out an arrangement, like putting yes, ads on Craigslist, yes. where they are looking yes. for someone to marry. And then they basically, I assume they split the added I guess, I don't benefit. Know. <laughs> There's some, well, that's an arrangement, arrangement. right? They get to negotiate that. Absolutely. Yeah. So like I said, marriage um, and the perks and the privileges, um, it's financial and people should be much more transparent about that. We don't like to say we're marrying for money, but when people give the top five reasons to marry, financial's in there. What if it was number one (laughs) instead of love? It might, and it has to Absolutely. be for some people, yeah. you know, you yeah. would have to assume. Yeah. And this is that sort of merging criteria that, that yeah. Amy talks about. Uh, so yeah. uh, we have two more. Um, okay. So uh, this one I found really fascinating uh, is yeah. the covenant oh, we... marriage. Because I, I have never heard of, of this before. A lot of people have not heard of it. <laughs> but, I, but I'm not yeah. surprised. So we struggle to put that it, in there because like, why would you want to put a more restrictive marriage in there? So to kind of explain what it is, uh, in certain states, I think is four, there is actually a separate okay. marriage license. There are two marriage licenses in the United States in those four uh, states okay. in the South. And um, of course, so it's you have to do much more before you can get married. You have to take classes and this and that. And you have to do a lot more if you want to split. Like you can't just divorce. Okay. Yeah, I wrote harder to get in and harder to get out. Well, who the heck in their right mind wants that? However, Mm -hmm. for the people who have entered into it, and it's not real. It's a very small percentage of people because it wasn't really very publicized. So people really didn't know very much about it. Um, it was, I think, okay. uh, the fundamental Christians, I believe, started this. It was, you know, it tied into religious stuff. Um, but the people who choose it because they're doing the premarital counseling together, they're having the conversations, they're going into it with eyes wide open, mm-hmm. they have satisfying marriages. Because what we discovered, yeah, whatever the model is, if you are on the same page about stuff, you have a more satisfying marriage. I also have to, as a scientist, 
who questions a bunch of things is like, I have to wonder is, are the people who opt into this also just the types who would have been just fine under a regular marriage anyways, because they're already so committed. Yes, probably. And, you know, community is a big part of that. And so with, you Mm -hmm. know, in, in this case, a religious community, and that helps keep people accountable. It also can really prevent people from leaving abusive things too. So it's, it's both sides yes, of the coin there. Right. But um, yes, probably, probably, probably. Maybe. We don't yeah, know. Well, we don't right. know. We can't we run the experiment, yeah. but yes. The, uh, so the last one, and I kept it for, for last for, for obvious reasons, <laughs> is... Uh, the live apart together relation marriage. Yeah. Yes. So I happen to really like that one the best. <laughs> And, so L- and LAT, yes, which, live apart together, a sort of solo, solo focused uh, marriage. Yeah, um, yes, because, and, and people have a hard time, like, well, why even get married if you're not going to live together? Well, because you mm-hmm. value your space or um, your jobs are in different places or you're just an independent person or you just can't put up with his crappy decor or whatever. I mean... Well, yeah, I I like to sleep with it being super cold, and you like to sleep with it being right, super exactly. warm. Right, exactly. And so, like in the last <laughs> year or two, people have been talking about sleep divorce, which is not really quite the same. It's like lat light in that you're not sleeping in the same room, but it but you're giving each other freedom, and that really works for some people. Like I think, like for single people, if you go like if you could find the best of single living and keep that into a relationship, what would you want? And a lot of people really do like their freedom and they really want to have a partner too, but they mm-hmm. kind of like their freedom. They want, they like their space, like to, their be space, their space. to be their space. Yeah. And you know, um, it is a mm-hmm. growing phenomenon, um, especially in Europe. Mm. Um, it's growing among older people. <laughs> um, mm. I wrote a, uh, article on medium like older women don't want to live with their romantic partners here why here's why and it went like viral uh and all the women are writing in going oh my god i'll never live with anyone again i'll never live with anyone again and i won't either i don't want to um uh-huh. i want you i want us to hang together what were what were um, some of the well, reasons if you but- have been let's say married before as a lot of the women were mm-hmm. um They've been there, done that. They've cared. They've been the main caregivers. Yeah, they yes, pick up the slack. Like, yeah. I'm done. Yes. I'm done with that. I get it. I yeah. do not and blame that them. That is a big for one for yeah. women. But there were men mm-hmm. who were feeling that way too. So, yeah. I always like to say is like you don't want to sleep with – like if, you're, if you have to parent your – your partner, there goes your sex life. <laughs> exactly. Right? And, and you know, all the <laughs> research shows that people who live apart are just as committed um, and they're mm. happy because they do have their autonomy. They actually have to work a little bit harder on their relationship so they can't take their partner for granted, which is what a lot of Very people do. You're living together. You're not even really spending quality time. You're just kind of occupying the same space whereas the people mm-hmm. who don't live together and then make the conscious effort to you know get on the plane or drive or walk or whatever to be together then they're they're more present and they appreciate that person in that moment in that time and um it really works for a lot of people it really does yeah yeah that's great i like i actually really like so again you know as you look if you if you look through these these marriages in in the book and you compare them to these kind of standards for the you know the gold standard of a quote unquote right. good relationship you know this idea that you might mm-hmm. not merge your infrastructure and your identity as much in this living right. apart together style yeah. style yeah. marriage yeah yeah and I, I like that idea you know I have, I have, I like this idea that for example non-monogamous relationships are often more yes. honest than monogamous relationships because they force a variety so of conversation that I really don't know if I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
but but the living the living apart together also has a little bit of that element like yes. you plan you plan to see each other you plan what you're going to do you know like date nights yes. are a real yes. thing not a like oh we should force ourselves to go yeah, out one night it, this week you have to be much more present yeah. and conscious about what you're doing as a couple when you when you don't live together 24 7 and um I don't mm-hmm. see that as a bad thing. I see that as a good thing. Um, you, yeah. It's very easy to become complacent in a relationship where that person's around all the time. And you can take them for granted and you can just forget to appreciate them. And, you know, but you really can't do that easily. And also, may I say, if you can't have sex all the time when you get together, need I say more? You want to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The other one, the other benefit is it also reduces the how annoying that yeah. person. Yeah. Oh be. my God! And so many right? people now, because of the quarantine, they're locked down. And I, I was yes. just reading these articles, and the woman is like going, "I didn't realize my husband was a circle back guy. I can't listen to him when he's on the phone conversations." <laughs> it's, you're finding out so much more about your spouse now. And that's funny. Look, you know, people can be annoying. Not you and me, Peter. We were not annoying at all. But some people can, and they have bad habits, no. and they maybe they snore really loudly at night, or they need, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, or they're too messy, or they're too clean, yes. or what, whatever. They, they, or they keep. Here's the other one I see. They keep well, uh, weird yeah. hours. Okay. Yes. Right. So you have a yes. night owl and a lark living together, and that's a that's tough. But a night owl and a lark living apart. Exactly. You just meet at three o'clock. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it you know, that kind of thing. a lot of the little niggling things that people fight about yeah. throughout the day because, but you don't have to really deal with that, quite honestly. Yeah. I'm not that interested in marriage, obviously, but, but this would be the <laughs> one I would choose. If I had to choose okay. from your list, yeah, this you is know, the one yeah, I'm going I'm with for. You. <laughs> The, uh, this actually reminds me, um, so I've had a couple breakups and it was interesting because the thing that, bro- that broke us up was not some fundamental incompatibility, but it was my partner saying, I want to move in. I want, I want us to move in. And I was, I did not want the relationship to end, but I wasn't willing yeah. to move in. And so, um, so that those, you know, that, that's sort of an unfortunate, the kind of mismatch. That is. At and that, the number at that of um, older women uh, or finding that that's what the men want. Yeah, because they want someone to, mm. you know, not to be cliche, but they want someone to cook and clean and take care of them. Now, I, I, I'm not saying, yeah, that, that's I'm right. not saying yeah. all people are like that, but if you're an old man, and you know, older man, and you're used to that, you're then, you know, and that's the women right. are like, <clears throat> no, not happening. <laughs> yeah. And I don't, I don't need someone to cook and clean because I there just outsource much of my <laughs> cooking and cleaning. And I can cook and clean when I need to, as demonstrated by the quarantine. But I, um, this, the last thing, I'll, I'll put it in the exhibits, but this reminds me of a, of a joke that Chris Rock has in, um, in, in one of his recent Netflix special called Tambourine. So uh-huh. he talks about his divorce you know, and his challenges with marriage and so on. But he has this joke, which I think is, is, you know, it's just the kind of thing that a comic would come up with. He's like, you know, my parents were married. I'm going to butcher this, but my parents were married for 40 years. He goes, but they didn't spend 40 years with each other. You know, he's like a third of the time they were sleeping and a third of the time dad was at work and mom was at home. And then, you know, the, so he's like, he's like, they were together for about yeah. 16 years, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. He goes, but in my marriage... He's like, my wife and I were communicating all the time. Like, I leave the house, and by the time I'm at the end of the driveway, there's a text message from her. You know, like this idea, like there is something to this idea that we are much, much more connected than we we ever were before. There's actually even less distance and less of a break, so to speak. That is true. Now, if you live apart, the technology works. Totally. It does work for you. But it has that flip. That's a good point. Twenty four seven, and you're getting texts. Don't forget to pick up the this and the that. It's like, <laughs> all right, yeah, like I, yeah, it's the same with poor kids nowadays. Like, you know, parents are like, where are you? What are you doing? Yes. You know, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like parents are tracking their kids on their phone. They yeah. know exactly so where they it's are. Too much. Yes, that's right. Well, Vicky, this was a lot of fun. I, you're, you're a delight, and you, um, 
I have to admit, I was like a little bit like, hmm, I wonder how this is going to go. I'm talking to I'm talking to someone who's putting forth yeah. more ways to get married, and I'm talking about fewer ways to get married. Um, but I think uh, I, I think what you're doing well, is you. noble I mean, work. One of the things that we do have in the book is why do you want to get married? And we really challenge people to mm. ask themselves why. Is it because all of your friends are getting married or your parents expect it or you think it's what you should do? Because, like I say, uh, we want people to do conscious coupling however that's going to look like. And maybe mm-hmm. they will decide that marriage isn't the thing. But if they do decide marriage is the thing, then, you know, they have options. We want them to know they have options. Well, that's great. So I really appreciate you writing the book and I appreciate your Thank time you, today. Peter, this was, was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me on. Cheers. My pleasure. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes, go to petermcgraw.org. Please subscribe and share with your single friends.